And uh, let's receive. All of that was receiving from God. Let me do, you know, I have to correct myself sometimes. Sometimes I want to, let's receive from God. Like, this is the only thing. No, I hope that during the song, you were receiving from God. Man, during the announcement time and the testimony, you were receiving from God. Whether it be talking about raising funds, man, you're receiving from God. We're hearing from God all the time, all right? So let's turn over uh, this morning's message to John chapter 2. We started a series called Follow Me. And what we're doing throughout this series is we're focusing on the words and the life of Jesus. And we said at the beginning of this series that as we focus on the words and the life of Jesus, that there's going to be things about his life that are going to challenge us. Or we're going to see Jesus and be like, whoa, I'm not like you. <laughs> that challenges me, that stretches me a little bit. And I'm hoping that we, even in those moments, say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow after you. There's going to be times that we look at Jesus' words and his actions, and we're like, man, that encourages me. Man, i I, I, I got to keep on going at this. i got to keep on doing this. People hated Jesus. They're going to hate me too. I'm just going to go for the good stuff, right? And, and then other things about Jesus are going to just inspire us and say, wow, Jesus, you're so amazing. And he called me to do the same thing. He called me to do greater things. Wow, there should, should be some Holy Spirit inspiration moments through this series. And last week we talked about the first picture of Jesus was Jesus as a little boy. Jesus is a 12-year-old boy going to the temple. And he, he, he told his parents, he said, didn't you know I, I would be in my father's house? And I encouraged us, and we kind of challenged us last week was, when we're following after Jesus, man, everything is on the table. And when we follow after Jesus, everything's on the table. When we listen to his word, when we seek after him, and we saw little Jesus, a little 12-year-old Jesus, hungry. Jesus, the Son of God, fully man, fully God, hungry. He was at the teacher's feet. He was listening. He was asking questions, and he was giving answers. And so, as we continue today, we're going to look again at a little bit of the early picture of, of Jesus' story. And again, it's going to be a time where we're inspired by him. I believe it's going to be a truth this morning that's going to, man, rev us up and get us excited about what Jesus has done for us. So John chapter 2, here we're going to read, it's uh, famously known as Jesus' first miracle. And I believe as we read through it, we're going to find three truths of powerful foreshadowings and implications for our everyday life. So John chapter 2, we're looking in verse 1, subtitles here in my Bible and most Bibles, the wedding at Canaan. So let's read here. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servant, Do whatever he tells you. Now there are six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now, became wine, and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This the first of the signs, this is the first of the signs Jesus did at Canaan in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. I want to pray this morning that God would uh, our ears would be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit, that we would hear from him and receive his powerful word. Let's pray. Uh, Father, you are glorious. You are wonderful. God, you are high and above. And God, I love the fact that we get to come before you this morning, open up your word, and receive from you. Holy Spirit, I give you free reign today to speak to us, to challenge us, to encourage us, and to inspire us to be more like Jesus. Father, I ask that our ears would be open. And Father, Lord, we receive your words. But Father, that our 
obedience wouldn't end just in hearing, but Father Lord, it would respond, we would respond in action. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We look at this story, there's a few different pictures of Jesus that we see. And the first one that, that jumps out to me is, is this picture of him, one, verses 1 through 4. It's Jesus, the obedient son. Hey, look at that, it's challenging, it's challenging, right? right? Jesus is the obedient son. And to his mother, he's like, no, not at this time. We're going to see here, though, that Jesus is the obedient son, that he exalts his sonship to this heavenly father above every earthly thing. We talked about this before, but man, again, it emphasized the Q1 part of the story, first miracles. Jesus is about the father's business. He only does what the father tells him to do. And so his mother at this time comes to him and he said, and there's a problem. Now, I would love to have grown up in Jesus' household, right? And to, Mary knew something about Jesus already that meant that she knew, hey, there's a problem, we need to go to Jesus. There's no wine, Jesus got this. You know, I don't know, there's not enough flour for the bread that week, and he was like, all right, mom, here you go, here's some more flour for you. I don't know how Mary came to this conclusion that, all right, Jesus is the one, but there had to have been some backstory to this request, right? He comes to Mary comes to him and says uh, that there's no wine. And it's kind of surprising to you, and to me, maybe to you too, Jesus' response to his mother, right? This son of God, or this perfect man, he responds to his mother, woman. Uh -huh. I don't know about you, I, that wouldn't go down in my house. <laughs> 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 Denver, if he responds, no, 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 sir, no, that's not going to work. But we could, you know, it kind of comes, kind of, kind of abrasive, kind of abrupt, but it's not disrespectful. It's like it was kind of like this moment in this. He's like, ma'am, he, you know, it's like, it, 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 ma'am, uh, what does this have to do with me? The only other place, this phrase, if we look at the, the Greek here, if we look at this phrase, the only other place that this is recorded in the New Testament, we, we find uh, it, uh, four other times, and every other time, it was actually a demon that would use this same phrase. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, is recorded this way, and when, uh, when Jesus comes and he's going to confront a, a, a demon, and the demon cries out to him, he says, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Basically, he's saying, why are you trying to tread on our space? Like, we have this thing going on here. And Jesus says this, the same to his mom. Ma'am, what are you doing? What, why are you calling on me in this moment? This is not my affair. You shouldn't be coming to me like this. Ma'am, it's not your place to call on my power, to call on who I am. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. His will was submitted to no one else except for the Father. Come on, that challenges me. I don't know if it challenges yeah. you. Only submit to the Father. That's right. See, Family, I, I, another point in, in this is, is family or position or uh, works, they don't conjure up Jesus' response. This is family ties here. It didn't matter. It wasn't a, that wasn't what was going to cause Jesus to respond to this. It, the closeness, the didn't know it, it, it. The only thing that was going to cause a response was whether it was in line with God's will for his life. And I will re respond to us, and I'm in, in, in thinking about that. Man, no matter who I am, no matter my pedigree, no matter my status, no matter how much I've worked, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, demand a response from Jesus. What demands a response from Jesus? What is it that Jesus responds to? What is it that God's heart is moved after? And Jesus said, at another point, also, at another part in his life, also makes this point that it's not a family, it's not status, it's not works that causes his heart to move or causes him to react. In Luke uh, chapter 11, verse 27 through 28, there was a woman in a crowd that he was with. 
and she raised her voice. And what did she say? She said, blessed is the womb who bore you and the breast that which you nursed. And what was Jesus' response to, to them? It was like, oh yes, I agree, my mom is the best. Gave her the number one mom mug last week. Oh, Jesus replied with interesting again. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and they keep it. Those who have faith in God and trust his word. Jesus wasn't interested in status. He wasn't interested in connectedness. He was about the Father. Those who put your faith and trust in Him, His response comes. Jesus is not into physical relationship, works, status, qualifications, deserve. No, I don't deserve anything. The only response is faith in His Father's love. Let that encourage us. Let that challenge us. First picture of Jesus. Miracle. Now, what does this have to do with me? Why are you calling on me? My hour <laughs> has not yet come. I love this next picture of Jesus in this miracle. My hour has not yet come. The jars that Jesus summons to go ahead and get ready this drink, this wine, this wedding feast, is these jars of purification. What were those for? Some of us are familiar with this uh, passage in this story, but these were not jars to drink out of, these were jars to bathe from. This was a ritual of purification, and Jesus, by taking these jars of purification, man, it was this amazing foreshadowing of his death, bringing purification that is going to be greater than any human order or any human right of purification or any effort on human part to bring purity into this life. Jesus at this moment is saying, I am the ultimate purification. Yes. Verse 4, my hour has not yet come. This is a familiar uh, saying that is repeated in John's gospel. Over and over again, when there is opportunity to do something, or opportunity to say something, or opportunity even for Christ's death to come sooner, again it's repeated, the hour has not yet come. John chapter 7, verse 30. They sought, the, the Jewish leaders sought to arrest him, but it says, but the hour has not yet come. In John 8, verse 20, again, they had sought to arrest them, but the hour had not yet come. And when Jesus with his disciples at the end, he, he uh, having dinner with them in John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus is beginning to talk about the end. The end is coming, and it says in John chapter 12, verse 23, the hour has come. And what was he saying? The hour has come, unless the grain falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies... It bears much fruit. It was never referring to the hour of coming. It was always referring to the purpose in which Jesus had come. To purify and to set free all humanity from the sins that, that have them bound. In John chapter 12, Jesus is again having this prayer and he says this, My soul is troubled, but you, he's talking to God, but you cannot save me from this, for it is the purpose of it is for this purpose of this hour that I've come. Jesus came to be the ultimate purification, to take away the sins of the earth. So it's not yet, Jesus' response to his, his mother, it's not yet, but I want to show you an amazing sign of what is to come. I want to demonstrate in this moment what it means to be purified. It is not a purification that comes from right. It's not a purification that comes from works. It's not anything that you can achieve on your own. But you're calling on me, and I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to foreshadow that there's a purification coming and only going to come from me. And it's going to be better than anything before. I love the fact that when the Servants take the water. It's like, you know, I just, 
I just love Jesus. He knew what he's doing, right? He, he, he gives the, the, uh, the water and they take it to the master of the, the ceremony. And he's like, this is the best wine ever. I mean, it's like an exclamation mark on this moment. Jesus, you're going to purify us and it's going to be better and it's going to be common. It's going to be handed out to everyone. And that's what I love about it too. That this purification, right, we was, there, was, there was specific ways to do it, there's specific people to do it, there's a separation for people, they couldn't even eat together because there's certain purifications that Jewish would do before they, they ate together, before they entered together, right? And there was, a, there, was a, there was like an elite club that they had made. And Jesus then takes that elite club, he breaks it all down, he says, no, this is going to be this water that you use to separate yourself, I'm going to turn it into wine that's going to represent my blood, that's going to, and I want to give it to everybody at the feast, and it's going to be the best ever, and so there's no separation now. He does it once and for all, for all people, for all men, I mean, he pure. This is pretty awesome. The old way of purification don't work with Jesus. And for you in this room, and I'm thinking in my room, and I, I don't bathe for purification. I mean, I bathe to get clean. But I mean, there's ways that I try to bathe myself when I sin and when I fall short of God. Man, there's shame that I carry. And I try to say, man, because I've broken down, I'm just going to carry on shame. There's, there's walls that I put up in, in front of me, and I don't allow people in because and, and I'm going to act right or I'm going to act a certain way around people so they don't know who I am. Man, there's, there's work. Sometimes I, I feel really bad or I, I've done something. So I try to work harder. I try to do something better so that I can try to purify myself. And Jesus, again, he said, the old ways, those ways, those ways of man, those ways that I do on my own, it, they don't work. They don't work. The only purification that is for us, the only purification that works, and it is the ultimate, is Jesus. It's his blood. It's his sacrifice. It's him. And in the simple example of turning water into wine, he's saying, man, I am the purification that is poured out for you. Jesus here not only gives us an example of his purifying blood that's going to be poured out for all to partake of, and it's going to be better than any other ritual, any other way, any other work of man. But he also pro uh, shows a picture that he is the all-providing bridegroom. As a married man, we celebrated last, last night, we were uh, together, all the couples were out at the park, we were you know, having fun. We laughed a lot, like I mentioned, maybe a little bit at each other, maybe a little bit with each other, uh, and uh, we had a really good time. And we had a time at the end, it was really beautiful, Joey Plantia, shout out to the newlyweds in the room, right, or the newest newlyweds in this room gathering, uh, but we prayed over them, and, and I was so enjoyed hearing Rachel's prayer, because it's a life lesson that we've learned, that we... Uh, as amazing as Rachel is, and as amazing Rachel believes I am, uh, we know, <laughs> we know that we cannot satisfy each other, that we can only find satisfaction in God. And as amazing as she finds me, or as amazing I find her, we will still fall short. And here in this story, we find uh, the first lesson of marriage, the, br the bridegroom fell short. He was in charge of preparing enough wine, and he missed it. If we're familiar with this, if we're familiar with this story, uh, uh, we know that it is common in the culture that the, that they, this is something that they saved up for. They saved up wine for this day to have enough, and to not have enough was an embarrassment. And their first day of marriage—I mean, it's not even—they haven't even got home yet, and he missed it. John the Baptist, in John chapter 3, he records his last words. John chapter 3, verse 29 through 30. Talking about Jesus, John the Baptist says this, The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the voice of the bridegroom. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. 
In this, John is recognizing, though he had an amazing ministry, to be the one, the voice of repentance, the one baptizing, man, he knew that there was one that was coming that was better than him, and in order for him to receive glory, in order for Jesus to be exalted, he had to decrease. John says, rejoice. Man, the better is coming. The one who provides all things is here. Jesus, the one who takes all of our needs and supplies every one of them, he's here. The bride is the church. We are the bride, and our bridegroom is Jesus. Jesus' first miracle is that Jesus does what the earthly bridegroom could not. He failed to do. He missed it. And Jesus sits in and fills the gap. Yeah. And whether we're married or we're just in relationships, or in any earthly relationship we have, we must understand this truth that humans will always fail. That's, that's a, it is a stated fact. And Jesus, though, will always come through. Amen. In our marriage, it challenges us to not get our to understand that our needs cannot be fully met in our spouse, it must remain still in Jesus. As a single person, we must remember always that all of our satisfaction is not going to be found in another human being, or to all of us, it's not going to be found in another workplace, it's not going to be found in another promotion, it's not going to be found in anything else other than Jesus. Wherever we fall short in life, He is the answer. And the beautiful thing is, as we come to Him, and this is a, 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 maybe a slight marriage lesson I wasn't even expecting, but as we come to Him, and as individuals, we are wholly satisfied and made whole in Him, then as we come together, we are stronger together. It's a beautiful thing. So my focus isn't, I mean, uh, as much as Rachel and we, we played, one of the questions last night was that who's, who's more romantic, right? And we had to play, play the shoe game. And one person on this side, the other person, we all had to raise our, raise our shoe, who we thought was most romantic. And Rachel loves the way that I pursue her. And I said, that's awesome. You know, that's, a, that's amazing. But as much as I pursue her, and much of my pursuit of her, my pursuit of Christ must be the yes. foremost and the front center of my life. Yes. Because in Him, I'm satisfied and then I'm able to give because I have nothing to give of myself to anyone. The person or individual that you seek, the position that you may seek, the promotion that you may seek, it has nothing to give you that cannot be found and should not be found in Christ and Christ alone. Mm -hmm. John says, rejoice. Jesus, our bridegroom, has come. John chapter 2, the 9 and, and 10, it says this, the groom was responsible for it. Jesus made up for it. And what Jesus had to offer is an even better, again, that better word is in there, right? The, the headmaster, he's like, you know, you, you're okay, it's okay if you just put the cheap stuff out now. Like, everybody's had enough now, if, you know, just put, but no, no, when Jesus does something, it's always better. And when I have to invite Jesus into my life on a regular basis, Jesus, because I know, man, I'm going to fail at this. Jesus, if you, get to, if you come and you do your thing, it's going to be better. And when people say, oh, Andrew, you're, you're really good at this, or you do this really well, or you love your neighbor, or, or oh, you're really patient with, with Denver. No, it's not me, it's Jesus. It's Jesus is the one that fills us and gives us what we need when we fall short and he gives us always is better than what we could have done yes. ourselves. Yes. Yes. So in this picture of Jesus performing this miracle, we see Jesus as an obedient son of God. Man, he's not swayed by pedigree, he's not swayed by status, he's not swayed by family relations, he's not swayed by work. He says, no, it's God's will and his will alone. Faith and trust in His Word, and it works. Jesus shows Himself as the ultimate purification. That He replaced all Old Testament rituals by His own blood. 
He replaces, uh, he, or he is better, he replaces any effort of our own to purify ourselves, to make ourselves better, to make ourselves right. No, he steps in, he says, my blood, it covers you once and for all. I love that Hebrew passage. Right? It covers you once and for all. What the priest used to do year after year, over and over again. No, my blood, it covers you once and for all. He is the ultimate purification. He is the all-providing bridegroom that fulfills our every need and fills in with something better where we fall short. Praise the Lord. Man, I opened up that with Psalms 148. Man, praise the Lord. Man, I just get it. Yes, God, you did it all. The question that we respond to this picture of Jesus today is have you made yourself ready for the bridegroom? Have you come to the one who purifies you and receive all that he has? Have you come to Him to get all of your needs met? The opportunity now is to come. The opportunity now is to say, Father, forgive me by the blood of Jesus that was shed in my place. Jesus, I come before you with all of my burdens and my needs. I recognize now you're the one that provides all things. I come to you, my bridegroom. I come to you, my provider. And I lay all these things at your feet. Jesus, you are the example of one completely submitted to the Father. Build my strength. Give me grace that in every area of my life, in any prompting of my life, I would submit fully, wholeheartedly to the way of the Lord. This morning I want to invite you to bow your head as we pray. Jesus, you're the ultimate sacrifice. You are the submissive Son of God. You are the one that provides every need with something better when we fall short. Father, I pray for your church followers of Christ sitting in this room. Lord, that we would know who to run to. The purification. Father, that we would know who to run to to provide all our needs. Lord, that we would submit to the example of one who is submitted fully the will of the Father. Strengthen us, Lord, with your grace. Strengthen us with who you are. That we may follow after you in every area of our life. Lord, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning I want to encourage us to take a moment, whether it be in your seats or up here, in prayer and go for the Lord. If there is purification that you need it, and maybe you've been going your own efforts, man, today is the day to ask forgiveness from the Lord, to receive that purifying blood of Jesus to wash over us and make us clean. And if there's something that you need and you are in need of, and you say, God, I need you to be that provider, man, I would love to pray and join in and say, yes, Lord, answer that prayer. If you're still struggling, struggling like I am to fully be submitted to the way of the Lord, oh, ask for the grace of God to strengthen you to walk in His ways. Let's take a moment to